This is Hacking the Afterlife podcast with Jennifer Schaefer. Jennifer! Richard! Hello. How are you? It's so good I to am... see you. How have you been? Happy holidays. I've been ha- very oh my well. My daughter's home. My son comes home next week, even though he's only in Santa Monica. Um, he's fine not, too, not too far. He's closer to me, but I haven't seen him around campus, as they say. Right. Um, and tell me about your tree. Because I know you don't kill trees anymore. You put up a fake tree. So how's I your fake tree? I did put it up. It's fabulous. It's amazing. It's I'm such a dork. I posted a video. You can look on my social media. Because I, I literally had all my decorations up on December 2nd. Who does that? <laughs> did. And then I realized, I'm like, how can I be getting all these things done? Like, how can I get all these things done? And I realized it's because my kids are gone. I get it. I get the whole empty nester thing. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I have... <laughs> Nobody to make a lunch for. Not that I did that in any way, but it'll be like, oh. no. It, but you could have. That would, you know, that's the whole point. Right. You could have made the lunch for somebody, but, but still, you know, I I know that. Like I, I actually thought about not even posting it because I know people out there are are. We discussed this last week. Are very um. Some people are in a lot of pain. Sure. Especially around the holidays, and you know their loved ones are no longer on the planet, and right. it's very difficult to say to somebody, "Well, you know, maybe you just want to talk to them," uh, and that's really hard because you know they are they're thinking about all that other stuff. But you can talk to them. It's true, you can, and here we've been demonstrating that for two years, and I I don't know if anybody believes this or not, but it, you know the whole point is. You can try these exercises. You know, we put up stuff to show people how simple it is to just picture yourself in a boat on a river and ask your loved one to stop by. And even if you're making it up, you have that experience of seeing them. And after doing it for 10 minutes, you feel like, I feel like I was just with them. And you were saying, Jennifer, about uh, the holidays and- The holidays, the holidays, as happy as we think that they are, when you get older, you know, or even when you're younger, people lose family members. And so it's a reminder of all those, like all those richly filled memories of, of the times that you're with that loved one. And as we've talked about it before, that is a place in time that you can go back to, that you can like bring into the present by remembering who they are and doing something different and making more new memories for your own family. And we've also talked about that idea of uh, using photographs uh, as almost like portals of asking them, speaking their name, talking about them in present tense. So when you're having a holiday, we've heard this a number of times recently, set the table for them, which is, I mean, it's a metaphor, but it's also literally, you can put a chair out for the loved one who would normally sit in that chair. It might freak out some of your relatives, but that's fine. And just say, look, I'm putting this chair out for Uncle Pete and Aunt Betty because I miss them and I want to talk to them and I want to toast them. Do it all in present tense. It's my goodness. Big... My dad just interrupted me. He goes, are you cooking this year? He knows I don't cook. He was just making fun of me. I mean, you can't make fun of me right now. Oh, hi, Dad. That's so sweet. Okay. Hi, Jim. What, well, Jim, uh, weigh in a little bit, please. What's your opinion about... What he just showed me was the chair at my niece's wedding. She married her longtime girlfriend, Miranda, and my niece, Miranda. And she was, it's so sweet. They had a table set up in honoring my father, and they put a chair out for him at the wedding. And it That's was beautiful. Beautiful. And he just, you know, I know I wasn't, so this is another, like, I know I wasn't thinking, and it just dropped, and things just drop. Yeah. Um, to remind you, and, and of course, you know, people will argue or think about like I'm making that up or that's something I wanted. But the truth is it doesn't make any difference because it's in your mind and you're able to communicate with people. And it's just like an, an ongoing conversation. And I, I want to talk about something, too, real fast. Please. I know like I had somebody that was grieving over someone and they wanted I gave them, in my opinion, a lot of a lot of information. But they were so desperate for me to say what was in front of them that, you know, it just skews things. When you're so desperate to get information, 
it doesn't work like that. If I could literally say exactly everything that's on the desk for someone, I can also give them the lottery numbers. It just doesn't work like that. It's interpretation. Yeah. I know when they were, I know they were grieving, um, but it just like, you have to be more open. If you're wanting some, something so bad, think about it. You're pushing what they could do for you. They're, they're, you're pushing them away. Well, are you saying like also sometimes they want a very specific thing? I want Uncle Pete to tell me where, you know, the will is. And so everything they hear about that, can, that's not and that. Can, and that. And I can look for that. But when they're saying that there's something in front of me, I connect with it every day. I connect with it every day. And he's trying to, the person was trying to show me. He showed me a locket and he showed me, you know, a picture. And he was trying to show me what it was. And it was, it was a locket of hair. <laughs> it was hair that she connected. I would have never, that's not in my will house. I would have never gotten that. Yeah. Cause we don't. You know? And she was open to interpretation. And I know it's just because she wanted validation and, and I'm, I'm so, I hope that she finds it, you know? Well, I, I was just answering this on our Quora hacking the afterlife group the other today, which was some people talk about evidence, you know, some people really need evidence, but, not everybody signs up, buys a ticket to the play to know how it ends. And some people have a journey that they're not supposed to know what's going to happen. And so their people on the flip side are not going to give them the answers they want because they because have to learn it on I, their own. Otherwise, yeah. I'd be getting lottery numbers all the time. And yeah, that's right. Resilient. Which would ruin their lives. 90% of the people win lottery wish they'd never bought the ticket. So... I wish I, I'll take my chances. Well, that's what everybody <laughs> says. You know, I'll be the 10%. Or I think it's actually like 5%. But anyway, uh, you know, about this time, we usually invite our friend Luana. Luana Anders, my pal who passed in 1996, who has continued to help us moderate and talk to people on the other side. So, Lou, what do you want to talk about today? Hira wants to come through. Hold on. <laughs> okay, very good. Set aside a place for your animal. Where would your animal be? That's hilarious. So for people Don't tuning in for the, for the people tuning in Don't for the first and the last time. I'm sorry, what did he say? He says, Don't forget the little people. <laughs> so four family members too. <laughs> So Hira is the only dog who's been nominated for an Oscar. He's the dog of Robert Town, the screenwriter, who used his dog's name for the screenplay for the movie Grace Stoke, which was nominated for an Oscar. Hira came through in a session that we were doing with Robert, the three of us, and Hira, because of his perspective, on the flip side, he's been over there for, I don't know, 40 years, uh, he was showing Robert something that only, showing Jennifer something that only Hira could know. And that turned Robert's door open to be allowed that it's a possibility that Hyra still exists. And since then, he's come through many, many times to talk yeah. about the dog's perspective, the animal's perspective. He says he's us. the ringleader. He's but the what? The ringleader. We would never expect anything less because he was that way here with humans. <laughs> That's right. Hyra used to deign to allow me to walk him. I would pull up the leash and he'd look at me like, are you nuts? And then he would... He would walk himself, and I would walk like twenty feet behind him. But, <laughs> but that was, but that was. Hyra was very unique that way because I, from the first time I met him, I remember thinking to myself, "This is not like any dog I've ever met." He's got a whole world that he's worked out. He wouldn't leave the room unless Robert left the room. He would yeah. just stay focused on Robert. And so here he is on the flip side doing the same thing. And he said, and he just gave you like a little, a little. I don't know, a little lick saying, thank you for walking me. Oh, okay. Very good. And that weird sound came in too. I don't know if you heard that. Um, yeah. That was okay, my, very good. The only thing I can get through is a schedule that comes in. A schedule <laughs> thing. Well, thank you, Hira. I appreciate that. Now, are you aware that I talked to Robert uh, yesterday, Jennifer? I don't know. I, I don't no, know. No, you aren't. So I want to, I want to give uh, Hira credit for this thought, which is, um, I have a screenwriting class and the end of class, Robert called. I know it. He called me. So that's why I'm like, Oh, so you, okay. So I don't, I didn't, I was with another client. When he but called. I, but I held up 
uh, my cell phone with the speaker on. And I said, Robert, here we are with these young screenwriters who are going to go out into the industry. Do you have any advice for them? And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, well, how about like a little tidbit, you know? And he said, well, uh, I will say this. Write what you really care about. Oh. Which was a wonderful way to put what we should do in life, whether it's art, music, whether theater, whatever it is, filmmaking, write and work up on the things that you really care about. Our class is like dancing to what you just said. They're like, because I believe all of them did that. You know, a lot, everybody did it in their own way. I, I had to say to Loana, thank you, because it was it was literally like the last class and the last moment and the phone rang. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, here's this Oscar winning screenwriter talking yeah. to writers about what they should do with their life and you know how does that happen the coincidence of it i mean that particular day that particular moment the phone working i think it, robert's really in tune and hira is showing me he has his clipboard <laughs> <laughs> you know, so hira you mean hira has his clipboard over at like lawana uh, does like just like you know just like i do with my you know right <laughs> Keeping an eye on things. Okay, yes. Lou, what else? You have the floor, ma'am. Make your holidays something that you'll never forget. That's interesting. I, like I always, we do things that we are, we feel like are either rituals or like me with my being, they call me dorkalicious actually, a whole group of friends of mine because I'm such a dork. <laughs> and so like me, like, you know, I do it, but did I make it memorable? I'm trying to make it memorable, but I love what, now I can't even remember what she just said. She just said, oh, make, make this holiday season the most memorable. Like, and how do you, what's a way to do that, Lou? What are you feeling inside? What would start off with, oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Start off with yourself first. What would make you incredibly happy? And she goes within reason, just don't, don't say, you know, getting the lottery or going to Italy, unless you're going. Um, okay. And then she's giving me all these senses of like food and how food is so caring and how people, that's the way that they give, like give it to the, give food to the homeless, go out and give it to if, like that. If whatever, whatever you're missing inside, give it to somebody else. So if you feel that you're, that you're, that you're a little bit lost or you're a little bit whatever, and you have the means to donate food, go give it to somebody that is really lost. Mm. You know? That's a good point. I, I was walking out of a restaurant the other night and, uh, you know, there was way too much. So I had a, you know, to go thing. And, uh, and I saw a homeless guy sitting outside and I said to him, if you have a fork, I have this, this plate of pancakes if you want it. And he went, you need a fork? And then he came over and out of his backpack, he pulled out a fork to give to me. And I went, no, 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 no. If you have a fork, oh. and then I gave him this giant stack of, you know, that's, I would never get to him. That's actually a rule in our house that whenever we leave a restaurant, if we have any food left over and we see somebody that's homeless, you automatically give it to them. Don't that's forget the fork, though. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they'll take it anyway. But no, it's a good point, which is uh, because, of course, I it was fun for me to give. I got a laugh out of it. You know, yeah. there was something more. It's like making that connection with other humans, whatever it is. I heard a, I saw a great story on the Internet about someone that was riding. He was doing a long bike ride. And this is in Portugal. He's doing this long bike ride and his tire blew. And he's the only way that he could get back home is walking his bike back. And there's this homeless person that was not too far away. And he was, he goes, hey, and, you know, and this person was just like, oh, great. I don't have anything to give him. He was going through his whole process. And he goes, I have a spare tire. <laughs> and he went, the homeless person went into his backpack. He only had <laughs> 10 things, but he had a tire, a spare tire that actually fit for this guy to use. Wow. This guy was so taken back and so um, just like he, he's like, how dare I judge this person thinking that he wanted something from me, but he took the one thing out of 10 things he had in his backpack, which made it to where I could go home. Yeah. And, he was, 
The next time I went bike riding, I came back, I brought him clothes. I brought him the shoes. I brought him everything he didn't have. And he goes, and he had a picture of him. And I know I cried too. <laughs> he had a picture of him. And he's like, how did I do that? Like, like we have all these judgments going up to somebody that doesn't have what we have thinking, oh, they want something, you know? And he's like, I can't believe I did this with my tire. He goes, and now he's going to, and it just, he said, what a gift he gave me. He gave me the shirt, literally like the shirt off his back when he had nothing. And beautiful. That's a beautiful it story. Just, it was so sweet. And he goes, but I still, that's all I gave him though. He goes, he should be in a better, you know, a better place or he should have something else, you know, but it yeah. was a very sweet story. And you always think like we get into our heads, like next time we get into our heads, have compassion, have compassion for those. People. Well, and to connect, to connect with somebody else. I mean, I think it's so important. I was, I just remember recently, I remembered the story. I was in Manhattan and a guy came up and he had scoliosis, you know, like a hump, hump back. And he had, he was all like bent over and he said, you know, can you help? And I, instead of just bringing out money, I said, so how long have you had scoliosis for? He said, what are you, a doctor? I said, no, I, I just recognize it. And then I had him sit down and we started talking and I said, you know, I've been doing this research and people claim that they, they, choose their family so why do you think you chose your parents and his reaction he looked at me he said because they love me unconditionally and i knew i could do no wrong he said i just gave up at some point because i just couldn't do the couldn't keep a job so we talked about that hmm. and you know i gave him whatever i had but connecting with him gave him a different perspective about his journey well, but I, you just segued into Robin Williams coming in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Robin, you're a perfect yeah. holiday guest. You get, and he's he's taking, he says that he's the one that gave you the idea to give that story right now. Tell that story. Well, thank you. You dropped that about that story, which is interesting. Um, hold on. He said you had a dream about him. You guys were laughing and laughing. Hold on. This is a few months ago, he says. But there was okay. a dream that you had with him. Yeah, it was a dream. Oh, it was around his birthday, he says. Okay. It was his birthday. And he says, you had a dream. And he says, all we did was laugh. We laughed about your books. We laughed about love, love. It was around Robert Williams' birthday. And he's saying that um, you guys laughed and you were talking about, you were asking him questions like, why is it so difficult down here? <laughs> <laughs> Like interesting. You wanted you were so like um you were just laughing though about it. Like, oh my goodness, if everybody could just wake up and you just were showing people waking up and wait, like what the world would be so much brighter, but everybody's just walking around, not understanding and not he's like, How can we wake up? Like you were asking him, how can we wake up people? Um and I of course I'm I don't remember it, but what did he say? What is a way to wake up people? By your books <laughs> oh yeah that and speaking of which robin thanks for the plug buddy divine love it it's such a great book I've heard number such seven uh you know in this genre but listen i and robin thank you i appreciate that because you're you're right we watched the fisher king just around right around your birthday and you you came up and the fisher king is a brilliant film he did with jeff bridges uh, Terry Gilliam's film, and he's brilliant in it. And he, yeah, we watched, I think we watched it twice. And, you know, his acting and it was so real and so honest and just so amazing. And, and of course, it, it totally makes sense that he would have gone right into and I would have continued our conversation. But Luana, I do want to ask you. So, sure. just real fast, how the books give people, you know, People are always connected. That's what everybody has to know. You're always connected, but your awareness starts going up. Like it starts getting more. You start getting more of awareness of what, of, <laughs> of it being limitless. Like of, of everything that's possibly out there, of everybody that you've ever loved or lost is, is around still. Um, and also that thing of, I was thinking about it today. It's the idea of somebody asked me, you know, on the flip side, can I just, uh imagine i want a cadillac and it'll appear and i started talking about the idea of what a cadillac is when you're inside a car you can't really see the outside of the car you're driving 
And the same thing is when you're in a body. You can't really see the outside unless you see a mirror. So we we do all this stuff of judging ourselves about the way we look or the way others look. But truthfully, while we're inside the vehicle, we can't really see what other people see. But we allow their opinions of us to, to alter our life and, to, and do our life. So the idea of if you can connect with what we really look like, which is a little bit like the fellow behind me with the wings, but it's more like a light. And if we could all see that we are lights, like a big Christmas tree light display, all connected, all different lights. If we could see that, then we wouldn't spend so much time suffering about what we look like or what other people look like. We are that, I mean, especially, I was so mean to myself. I would never say to other people what I say to myself. Mm. You know? And I know, I'm like, at one morning, I'm like, oh my gosh, I am so lucky to have this body. I am so lucky to be healthy and to be happy and to like, what in the world did I do waste by wasting time being upset or being like, you know, my pants didn't fit right or whatever it is. So stupid. It's just ridiculous how, you know, how you can get. But I, or, or we let other people judge the way we look and then we change it because someone has told us, right. Oh, you know, your lips need to be bigger. Your eyes need to be bigger. Your, Hair needs to be, I, whatever it is. Yesterday we were in a restaurant and a guy said, oh, I love your hair. And I looked at him and I said, no one's ever said that to me in my life. So I just thought I it was. Said it. A, I a, what said a, it. Good, but I mean, what? You know, I just thought that was so funny. I can't see myself. So I could see him and I started talking about his goatee, you see? So that's the idea. Find the thing about somebody that's that you're meeting that's interesting that they can talk about because then he started talking about his life and he was always trying to grow a goat when he turned 40 finally it sprung out so you know just connecting is so important especially in the holidays give somebody a smile don't get mad like i sit there and laugh i've become my father yelling at cars that can't hear you for people mistake. <laughs> oh my gosh i'm now my dad <laughs> I'm doing it in front of my children. It's just like, hilarious. It just doesn't mean anything. It's not going to make like, you know. Well, Luana, you know, I've only got Jennifer for so long. So last night I did have a dream where I was having a dream. I was having a conversation with somebody. Okay. And I asked that person if they wanted to come and talk today. And uh, Luana, if that person wants to come forward, put them in our chair. Otherwise, invite whoever it is you want to speak with. Do I know who it is, though? You you would, yeah. But, you know, this person might hop in the chair and give you a different image of a, somebody with the same first name or give me a... Is it the woman from Fleetwood Mac? Oh, Christine McPhee? No. Oh, we did ask her last week if she wanted to come forward. And at the time, she was like, I'm, I'll I'm just wanna, watch. So this just give me a second. Give me one second. Because when you said that, I there was a, like a probably fifty images that went by, so I have no idea. All but, right, well, pick the most famous image if it was a person. Can I do that? It was Elvis, but I'm not going to do that. Hold on. That's close. That doesn't help. Uh, <laughs> well, music related. Well, I know that they're showing me music related. That's why I got a plethora of musicians. Hold on. Does, uh, you know, Lou, does this person want to sit Yeah, this person does, but they're laughing. But they're having fun teasing us. Yeah, but I don't like that. <laughs> this, person, this person play guitar. Yes, he okay. did. Who is it? <laughs> Okay, does it have anything to do with the Beatles? Yes. Okay, they showed that to me in the pandemic. You only have two choices now. I didn't know. I didn't know. So, well, John. Yes, John. All right, it. so yeah. is this... Why did so, you do that to me? That's so easy. <laughs> I know it's easy, but That's you know, he. they made it different, difficult because it's more fun that way. Come on. It doesn't have to be easy. And by the way, there's a thousand musicians, right? That we have that we deal with. So in fact, I did get it, but they made me work it for it. Ah, okay, so okay, it's about the point they do. Okay, it's about the process. So don't give up when you get something that's not 
Okay, yeah, exactly. it, right, the, the right thing, yeah. So John, uh, why did you show up last night in my head and what do you want to talk about? Because you were writing a musical piece, he said, in your dream. Okay. That you were doing something in your dream. So I also wanted to talk to you about, hold on, I don't know, something about Julian too. He's very proud of Julian right now and everything he's doing. Oh uh, yeah, his his album is fantastic. Oh, and there was this great moment where Julian was at the airport and ran into Paul. And Paul showed him on, you know, a cell phone that he was listening to his album, Jude. Oh, I love that. Well, uh, when they ran into each other. Well, I heard a funny thing that he said. Okay. And I said, and, and what I heard him say was, people are reading your book. And I said, like, really? You know, on the planet? Like who? And he said, no, not on the planet, off the planet. I said, who's reading my book? And he said, the queen and he said like is that a, is that important enough for you so now i'd like her to come forward do you mind is that possible lou we haven't talked to her okay i Did was she... thinking, i was thinking of queen elizabeth you know the Tudor days oh so... the old one no no that's the new yes. one yeah. that's who he meant and uh, so i thought oh great you know <laughs> let's ask her to come forward so but I do have some questions for her if she wants to talk to us. And that's the question. Lou, is this possible? Yes. Okay. My question, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we fought a revolution so we don't have to get the, all those terms mixed up. But let me ask you, who was there to greet you when you crossed over? My husband. And are you familiar with uh, Luana's friend? And Luana's her, her unborn child. Oh, and an unborn child. Okay. He's either a mis or a child. A that miscarriage. Died, a child that died right after they were. After birth. And what was that experience like when you saw this person? Joyous. Joyous. Like joyous. I, and are you familiar with what we're doing? I'm I'm assuming that you are. I want to sit up straight. Sorry. <laughs> um, she's learning. Okay, very good. Um, she, I, she's been inspired. She's she's always believed in the other side. And then she showed me Princess Diana, or Princess Diana showed up. And what was that like when you two reconnected? Hmm. Just tears, lots of tears, like tears of joy reconnecting. Sweet. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of specific questions. In Jennifer and my interview with Carl Sagan, the scientist, he referred to you as somebody who helped him realize where he was. I'm Jennifer probably doesn't remember this conversation, no. but it was the idea was that he was because he was so of the belief that there was no afterlife. He spent a lot of time, as he called it, wandering around vistas, looking at different vistas and not seeing anyone, but that of somebody stopped him and said, I'm here. And then he recognized you and said, but wait a second, you're still alive. And you have replied, I know, and that was what, now did that event happen as you remember it? There was a lot more, I think there's a lot more details. Okay. But yes. Do you want to give us any? Um, when, okay, that's so interesting, hold on. I feel like she gave him more to be inspired by. She's showing me books. So there was a moment in time because I looked up their relationship and as it turned out, you know, to see if Carl had ever met the queen. Oh, and, okay. And, she, she was very fond of him and it looked like it was letters. Well, there was a time, letters make sense, but there was a time when they actually got together and it was, he presented her a photograph of okay. uh, the Voyager, you know, the one that had the record on it and it was traveling in deep space. And it was a photograph of the rings of Saturn, like a close up. And so I didn't realize they had met, but they actually had met. Um, all right, the second question I have for you, Luana. What she was saying, 
He was saying he corresponded. Okay, letters. Saying, All right. So, uh, he was a fan of yours, and you were a fan of hers. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so my question to you, uh, Peter Townsend, not the musician, but the person that you knew in your lifetime. We've spoken to him because Luana apparently knew him. Not in her lifetime, but in other lifetimes. Do you know who I'm speaking of? Your Royal Highness, I'm asking you. Do you know who Peter Townsend is? Yes. Yes. And, and have you talked to him or has have, have you? He says she's talked to everyone. So it, just, just describe what that's like for you. She's showing me pictures of Peter Townsend. And she's showing me like being out in the, um, like photo, I don't know if it's photographs, but it's like being out in, I don't know, with her dogs and everything, uh -huh. horseback riding. Um, I don't know, something with the horses, something with like, I don't know who Peter Townsend was to her. Yeah, but. this was uh, this was a, a a soldier, a pilot, RAF pilot, who okay. was in love with uh, her sister Margaret, right. yeah, and Margaret. and apparently uh, she convinced her not to pursue that, and they sent him away. And so I was just curious because you know, That's, okay, so that was interesting. They showed me an outhouse, um. <laughs> an outhouse. He was sent to the outhouse. Uh, I mean, look, there's so many people that people want to hear. About, but just to generally, your what she says is that there's a she shows me there's like a the blueprints. Yeah, you know, showing me the you know when you the blueprints of a house like the blueprints of your soul. Yeah, um, it's just an understanding. Like she wasn't the bad guy, but it was just an understanding of how everything worked. Well, also you played this incredible role for so many people, and I'm sure people like Lord Mountbatten, who you know was a, a close friend of the family, and he was. You know, he died. He was murdered by the IRA, and and all these people that people are want to know what it was like for you. But if it's just in general, what was it like for you going back and seeing all these people whose lives you had profoundly changed or affected? She showed it to me in two ways: how they were very like the standing ovation that she received you know, with all the hard work she did, but then also she showed me being in the room, also clapping for somebody else, also clapping for the ones that maybe she didn't get along with, that she understood their path and what the importance of it. The role that they played in their lifetime. And so what was that like for you to run into she's John? Saying, Sorry. Uh, she's saying how that should, how that was, um, very challenging for them to do what they had to do. Your Royal Highness, what was it like to see John? Let's just put it that way. They were playing when I crossed over. <laughs> okay, very good. So it was like a musical entrance. I'm like, did you get, she showed me Jimi Hendrix. I'm like, no. She goes, no, he didn't interview me, but he was there. He was there. Was, interesting. was he playing? Sorry, playing. With John. Very good. John. So, John, today is a day that lives in uh, infamy for a lot of people. Sorry? Okay. So, hold on. She's sharing with me. So, one of her, you know, the celebrations, like she had the Jubilee. I'm sorry. It's a Jubilee. But um, they redid a reenactment of one of her Jubilees. Oh, wow. That she had. And that's how it was going over. Beautiful. Which is interesting. Beautiful way to put yeah. it. And John, today is a day that lives in a lot of people's hearts and minds because it was 42 years ago that you shot. Right? Yeah, and we've talked about that. You talked about, uh, I don't know if Jennifer remembers, but he described walking onto a stage where Jimi Hendrix was playing guitar and it was and like the band was waiting for him. Yeah, okay. That's They were one step ahead, but she was saying the same thing. That's so interesting. Okay. And and I asked him what song they were playing, and he said blue suede shoes. He showed you a pair of blue suede shoes, and then I looked that up, and it turns out that both John and Jimmy recorded that song independently of each other within a year. Um, and we asked, it was that an homage to Carl Perkins? And I, at the time, I think he said Elvis. So uh, anything, any comments you want to give to people out there on the planet who are uh, tuning in? and disbelieving what we're talking about? 
it's easier to believe. You don't have to believe anybody else, but it's easier to believe in yourself. It's easier to believe. And then he's just, you know, he's just showing me that he's making me hear that song that you actually have in your two books ago that you look at all these people. Um, you mean imagine? You know, yeah. He goes, it's easier to believe and it's easier once you believe in yourself to believe that there's more out there. What do you think um, about Julian's version of imagine? It's better. <laughs> it's more intricate. It's beautiful. It's more lovely. But he says angelic. More angelic. It's more angelic. I don't know. I haven't. I don't it's, know. It's on guitar. It's very simple. He he broke it down, and it's very beautiful. Um, and I was just curious what his thoughts about it. You know, we're uh, Jennifer and I are fond of saying the lyrics of Imagine really reflect upon what the flip side seems to be like. Yeah. Almost like yeah. you were presaging your experience now. Yeah, but he said if you can live, you know, just hear that song and live in that song, he says so many other things open up because eventually you'll start believing it. And then if you start believing in it, you'll start believing in yourself. He says, and then he shows me the whole circle, like with the world. Very good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know I have to go. I'm I so know sorry. you have to go, and I'm sorry to uh, to do this to the audience. Where at the very last minute I say, "Okay." And by the way, behind door number three, it's just funny because he did in my mind. I I was you know having this conversation with him, whether it's real or not. I'll just assume that it is, and him saying, you know, uh, the Queen likes your book, which is really a funny thing to say because it's like, wait a minute. How could she read that? You know, and now it's like, oh, she's aware of that. So I wanted to invite her. And by the way, uh, Queen Elizabeth, you're always welcome to come and chat with our class or hang out because uh, everybody here like knows you. We're all fans. Go ahead. Say again. She will stop by. It was wonderful seeing Princess Diana. Very Just good. The exchange was very sweet. It was very sweet. Um, yeah, I won't, I won't ask goes, her her opinion about the Netflix show that's about her son. She just walked away. Hold on. She says it was well done. Have you seen it? She's like the truth. Yeah, she says she's seen it. She says the truth comes. I have it. No idea. I yeah, know it's, it's out there, but I she says the truth has to come out somehow. It is very well done. Thank I watched an episode today. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Princess Di. We appreciate that. Thank you, John. And thank you, Luana. And thank you, Queen, your Royal Highness. Thank you very much. I know people in England get upset if we don't say it properly. And thank you, uh, Jim, Jennifer's dad. And who would I forget? Yes. Anybody? I forgot. I forgot Mark and Mindy. And uh, Robin. Oh, yeah, Robin and Hira, the king of Hira. us all. All right, very good. Love, love. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll okay. catch you next week or on the flip side. All right, bye. Bye. This has been Hacking the Afterlife podcast with Jennifer Schaefer. For more information, jenniferschaefer.com, martinizone.com, or richmartini.com. Hacking the Afterlife documentary is available on gaia.com via Amazon Prime.